How on earth are you going to have an informed debate when you've got people shutting down science education throughout the world, countries stopping teaching of Darwin and evolution and stuff like that? How, mm. how can you have an informed debate when there is a shutting down of the information? Yeah, you can't. So education is absolutely key. And, um, and, you're, and you're right, there are places where it becomes more difficult to talk about evolution by natural selection. This isn't one of those places, this isn't one of those countries, and Europe isn't one of those continents. Um, there are problems in parts of the US, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of, it's not, it, the whole of the US isn't like that. There's, there's pockets of it, and then there's pockets of huge liberal openness as well. And I kind of think that that will win the day, eventually. You have to think that, don't you? Otherwise, you just give up. Um, I think that, it, you know, it, the road to enlightenment is, is, a, is a long and, and, and difficult one, and there's setbacks along the way, but I kind of think in the end the truth, the truth will out. But we have to fight it. We have to, to work to do everything we can to maintain a liberal and an open education system. It's absolutely key, yeah. And any more questions? Uh, one, the one there. One more that way. When I first started uh, reading about Darwin and the theory of evolution, this was a long time ago, I formed the impression that one of the central tenets was that whatever happens to an individual in their lifetime didn't change uh, the genes that they passed on to their offspring. Has there been some research in recent years that suggested that may not actually be the case? Yeah, so when, when Darwin was, was working, you see, Darwin had no theory of heredity, so his idea was that all of the cells in the body contribute to the next generation. He had this idea that um, all cells produce something called gemules, and these go towards the next generation. They, but now we know that they don't. There's a, specific, there's a specific lineage of cells that give rise to the germline, and they're separate. There's a germline, and then there's the soma. So the somatic cells are cells in our skin and our liver and our kidneys and so on, and the, 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 the germline are the cells that go to make up our gonads, our eggs or sperm. And they're the ones that if, if they have a mutation in them, then that's what gets passed on. The rest of, the, the rest of our cells, they, they kind of matter. So we can get mutations in our, in our skin cells or in our, in our liver cells or our kidney cells that can go wrong and they can kill us. They can cause tumors, right? They can all sorts of diseases. So, so, so mutations matter to us, but we're not going to pass those down. It's the, it's the mutations in our germline that we're going to pass down to the next generation. So you can get hereditary cancers where there's a germline mutation in some important gene that regulates cell behavior, and that can get passed on, so you can get families of sufferers. But a lot of the time, they're, they're sporadic, they're somatic. When, when you talked about the mapping of the human genome <coughs> being carried out by hundreds of researchers across the globe, what did they actually map? Because it wasn't just one particular gene, yeah. one particular human. Who's human, yeah, whose genome. I thought, you know, yeah, I think they pulled about 30 or something. Um, and they, and, they, and it, the, there are certain people that had their genome sequenced in the early days, and it's kind of, yeah, what, does that constitute the right, the, the reference genome? Is that somehow, is that n the normal genome? And everyone else has to be I mean, sort of, you know, matched up to that and see where they differ or not? I mean, it... It's a really interesting question because, of course, there's a huge amount of variety, variation at the, at the, the sequence level between your genome and my genome. There, there's probably a difference every thousand or so base pairs. So we have 10 to the 9 base pairs in our genome, so an awful lot of variation between one individual and another. So presumably, at the end, you can only define the typical human genome. Yeah probabilistically. Initially, now of course, it's so much easier to sequence geno our genome, you know, a few hours and a couple of hundred quid. So now, these genomes are getting very personal, and they can be lined up one against the other and, and, and compared and contrasted, and, you know, does this person, what, you know, what disease does this person have compared with this person, and can we see anything at the sequence level that's going to tell us how that might be caused? or you know, what might affect the prognosis of that disease. So it's changing, but it started off as a sort of 
a kind of averaging out kind of genome, yeah. And uh, there's a question at the front as well. Thank you very much. Um, I understood that a large proportion of our genes determine different things like blue eyes, and, but another, perhaps even bigger proportion, switch on and off different oh, genes. Yes, yeah. No, that's a really, really important idea. So, um, yeah, what I've told you has been a bit simplistic, okay, because uh, you, you might not think so, but actually, the problem is that all of our cells contain exactly the same genome, right? Because that's what makes us human. So all of our cells contain the same DNA. And all of our cells have come from one initial cell. And I've told you that there's a lot of effort that goes into copying it absolutely accurately and divvying it out accurately. So that means that your liver cells are going to contain the same DNA as your brain cells and your skin cells, right? But obviously, they're doing very different things. So, even though, so you've got the same genes in your different cells, but actually they're doing very different things. And they do different things because they can be switched on or off. So what switches genes on and off? The answer is proteins called transcription factors that come along and interact with DNA and say, right, this is a liver cell, so I'm going to switch off all the heart genes. Otherwise, my liver cells might turn into heart cells, and that's never going to be a good idea, right? So that these transcription factors come along and do that. So they're the switches. So where do they come from? <laughs> right. So the answer is that they're proteins, so they're encoded by genes. So there are a lot of genes that give rise to these regulatory proteins. Okay. Now you can ask the question, okay, so what controls those genes right, that give rise to the regulatory proteins? Yeah, and that's a really, really good question. And the answer is other transcription factors. Okay. So where do they come from? So, so, so they, again, come from genes which are regulated and so that so then you very quickly get into a bit of a chicken and egg argument and it's a conundrum that I, I can talk to you in detail about later but it's a conundrum it all it does actually go back to the, the next the, the preceding generation okay uh, there seems to be a slight contradiction in that you said many times that the mutations are random Mm. Uh, but you actually showed that um, you get bacteria that can slice, slice out and repair the genes. Mm. Um, isn't the random, while I appreciate randomness is predominant, but there are actually mechanisms, chemical and biological, yeah. which can produce mut mutations yeah. in the same sense. Yeah, that's, and that's a really good point. So that example at the end, that CRISPR-Cas9, um, that is an example of a sort of directed mutation strategy. And it's a, very, um, it's a very specific need. It's kind of like the immune defense of the bacterial cell. It gets invading DNA and needs to get rid of it. But most of the time, mutations, when there's a change to DNA sequence, it's just because uh, it could be that there's been some DNA damage. So every time you go out in the sun, you're going to damage your DNA. Um, it, it's also because the, the very machinery that actually replicates DNA, and I've told you it's so accurate, that's a bit of a lie, <laughs> because actually it's, it's error prone. But it's error prone at a very low rate. But that means then that mutation is actually part of the natural way of replicating DNA. And without that error prone DNA replication machinery, we'd probably still be in the primeval soup. But it's a very interesting idea that the ability to evolve has kind of evolved, <coughs> I think, yeah. I hear that Chinese children have, have their DNA taken at birth. I wonder what that may, might lead on to. Um, well, I suppose on one level it leads to a fantastic database <laughs> that you might use to say all sorts of things about, you know, how how you characterize a phenotype, how you, um, it, it may enable you to co correlate particular sequences with particular characteristics, with particular diseases, and so on. Um, I think you have to worry a lot about the ownership of that kind of data and how it's regulated and who owns the information about their own genomes. Um, so I think there's all sorts of questions. You can imagine, you know, there's also, there's also projects in the UK where people can send DNA sequence to this biobank idea that, you know, that we need a huge amount of data. But with data comes responsibility, I think, in, to, keep that, to keep that data in a particular way. Not, you don't want to apply for life insurance and then get told, oh, no, your DNA sequence is a bit dodgy. 
We're not, you know, we're going to have to pay a thousand pounds a month more than this person who's got a much better genome than you have. I mean, that, that doesn't sound like a good outcome. But in terms of a database to try to correlate the genotype with the phenotype, in other words, our characteristics, who we are, what we are, you know, I'm sure we can, we can tell a huge amount from that information, but it, it must be used properly. And that's why, you know, this isn't just a debate for scientists to have. It, it, it's for everyone in society to, to think about that and to worry about that and to think about how it might be, how, how we take forward things so that we get the good and we don't get the, the bad. Thank you. Um, how does mitochondrial DNA oh. fit into all of this? Uh -huh. Yeah. Or is this uh, for another lecture? Well, no, no, no. So, so basically, <laughs> mitochondrial DNA is a bit kind of rogue. Um, so our cells only contain exactly two copies of all of our nuclear genome, so our chromosomes. We've got two of them, only two. No, not more, not less. We've got loads of mitochondria in each of our cells because they, they like make energy. They're like battery packs um, for the organism. And they contain their own DNA, but they don't contain all the DNA that they need in order to do their thing. They're sort of reliant on some, of our, some nuclear genes as well. But it's really interesting that mitochondria contain their own DNA. And it says that mitochondria were probably once free-living bacteria that sort of moved into a cell. And the cell thought, hey, this is really useful. You know, now I've got this guy doing all my energy production. I can go on to do something else. So that's probably how mitochondria evolved. Um, but they've got their own genomes. And when a, when a cell divides, it's, it's like the Wild West when it comes to mitochondria. Because the nuclear genome is very precisely divvied out amongst the daughter cells. But the mitochondrial gene... DNA, the mitochondria themselves, just kind of willy-nilly. Some go one way, some go the other. It's all, it's all a bit random. So that means that we are a sort of genetic morass in our mitochondrial de genomes of some good genomes, some pretty bad, you know, some mistakes. And actually, there's more mutations in mitochondrial DNA than in, than in our nuclear DNA because the, a, a sort of byproduct of energy production in the cell is a lot of kind of toxic stuff that's not very good for DNA. It tends to cause more mutations. So, so mitochondrial genomes evolve faster than nuclear genomes. Um, that really interesting, interesting genome to study. And um, Pete, I think a final question we have right upstairs. Could you wave because it's quite hard to see you down here. What about when we come to these actual people, how are they going to be part of it to say, this is affecting me because you chose these genes for mm. me? Yeah. Where, where are these people going to come from to be involved in that debate? Yeah, I think... So Genetic Alliance UK would be a really good example of, of a patient group, an umbrella organisation that represents people with a whole variety of genetic, single gene genetic disorders. Um, and I think, I think they are a good organisation that gets involved in some of these debates, that can represent a wide group of different kinds of patients. And those individual patients are absolute stakeholders. I think when you, just, when you fiddle around with genes that are not going to be passed on, it doesn't strike me that that's so dissimilar from having a heart transplant or something like that. Right? In fact, it's probably less of a a weird thing, because it's not like you've got a bit of someone else inside you, it's just that someone's done something really tiny, changed a little base or something like that. But when it's a gene, when you're changing the germline, and that's going to be passed on forever, you're changing the whole destiny of that family at the genetic level, aren't you? And that, to me, seems like a, a different thing to do. It might make more sense to do it that way, because if you're engineering out a disease like cystic fibrosis, Right? If you engineer it out of an individual sufferer, then actually you're going to increase the amount of cystic fibrosis in the world because that person is going to be more likely to successfully reproduce. And, but they're, if they're not engineered at the germline level, then they're, not going to pass, they're only going to pass on the disease gene. So their children are going to have cystic fibrosis. So you're going to have to engineer them as well. Right? Whereas... If you just engineered the germline, then problem solved for the rest of time, right? But supposing you got it wrong, supposing you made a mistake, supposing it turns out that actually your disease mutation has a benefit in a way that you never understood before, then it's gone forever. So, you know, I think there are, there are interesting 
debates to be had and conversations to be had around that. Yeah. Well, uh, that's a phenomenally <laughs> thought-provoking and uh, <laughs> interesting end, but uh, I just want to thank you again for a wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Alison. You're welcome.